Hey, I'm Mia Hemstad. I'm a wife, I'm a mom of two kids, and I'm a trauma-informed self-care coach. I also live with diagnosed PTSD and depression. I started sharing my mental wellness journey online in 2017 when I was diagnosed with postpartum depression and anxiety. And since then, I've heard from hundreds of women who all struggle with the same thing, putting ourselves last. This is a struggle that's keeping so many women burned out and unhappy, through no fault of our own, by the way. I've been working on my own healing as an abuse survivor since 2013. But when I became a mom, I really started to do the inner work of figuring out why I was putting myself last and how to start prioritizing myself for the first time in my life. This podcast is about sharing all of those lessons with you. So if you're interested in hearing honest stories, life advice, and inspiration that encourages you to make your health, happiness, and well-being a priority, then definitely stick around. Welcome to your No Longer Last journey. Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. I'm so excited because today is the last episode in the Anti-Burnout Self-Care series. I hope you've been enjoying this series as much as I have been enjoying creating it. It was fun to kind of challenge myself to bring in my best tips and strategies to help you avoid burnout, or if you're in it, to climb yourself out of it. So yeah, let me know if you've been enjoying this um, this series so far. Um, but today is a very special episode. It's all about the one thing that I believe all mothers should be fighting for, and I believe in this so ferociously. So I'm so excited to be sharing this episode with you. So the one thing that I think all moms should be fighting for is support any form of support that can bring ease and comfort into your life. And I know that at first glance, you might be thinking, Mia, what support? Who, what, where, when, how? And I want to say that I understand because we don't live, well, I live in Portugal, but as you all know, I'm from the U.S., We don't live in a society that really offers that much support. And it took me a long time to find ways to be creative and resourceful and just ferociously fighting for support. And I want to say that it hasn't really gotten easier, but it is something that I will keep advocating that we fight for. Because while it's not easy to find support in today's modern parenting world, it's still the most important thing that you can do for yourself. I mean, in this series, I've taught you how to look within and figure out what you need. I've taught you how to identify your self-care priorities with the 4B framework. I've taught you about the three types of boundaries. And I talked I talked about delegating as one of those boundaries. And so I don't want to just leave you hanging with, okay, well, now what? I have these needs. I know what self-care I want to do. But there's no one to delegate things to, Mia. And I need more support and I need more time and space in order to actually take care of myself. And so that's why this is the last episode because we cannot wrap this up and give you a real framework and a real plan for how you can avoid burnout without talking about this need for support. And it's because while, you know, maybe before you became a mom, you were super hyper independent like me, you were able to figure it all out. I mean, I literally went on a plane for the first time since I was like seven years old when I went to college. Like I hadn't been on a plane in 10 years. Here I am, 18 years old, going on a plane by myself, going to California, no cell phone, like a couple thousand dollars in my bank account that I saved from housekeeping throughout high school. And I literally put myself through college, figured out how to apply for scholarships, figured out how to apply to college, like got myself through school, got myself a corporate job right away. You know, I'm a survivor and All of that is fine and good until you become a mom. And then all of a sudden, even though you're hyper independent, you're super skilled, you're super resourceful, you need support. And that's because motherhood is the only job that inherently requires us to have support in order to thrive. You can survive motherhood on your own, but you cannot thrive in motherhood without support. And that is why I believe it is the one thing that we have to fight for. And unfortunately, I mean, I've been a mom for seven years now and it has not gotten easier to find support, but I've gotten better at approaching it in a way 
that is very dogged and stubborn and I don't really fumble too much with the mindset issues around asking for help and seeking support and demanding it sometimes like in the workplace or at home for instance when it comes to fairly sharing the domestic labor and the mental load of parenting with my husband. So today's episode is about helping you identify the obstacles to you getting support because let's face it you already know that you need support but maybe you feel lost and hopeless in the search for it maybe you've fully given up and we're just like there isn't any support here i'm just gonna have to fight this and thug this out myself and you are just feeling really lost and hopeless in that i want to say that i hear you and that's completely understandable and I do not want you to keep drowning. That is unfair, it is wrong, and it creates a negative ripple effect that harms not just you, but your children. Because when we're exhausted and burned out, let's be real right now, no one around us is benefiting from that. So I take this very seriously, and it's one of the things that I've worked super hard on within myself, but also with the 25 women that I have worked with and coached over the last three years. So today, without trying to go into a three hour masterclass on getting support, I'm doing my best to cover like the main obstacles to getting support that I've seen from working with myself and also with my clients. And hopefully some of these resonate with you and can help you. So the first obstacle to support is obviously money, limited financial resources. A lot of people struggle to have the money they need, disposable income to hire help. And I wanted you to know that I'm right there with you. My husband and I, yes, we live in Portugal. We used everything we had in order to make this move. But the reason why is because it wasn't sustainable for us to stay in the States. And we knew that with the lower cost of living, that maybe we could have a little bit more support. So the lower cost of living has enabled us to live on one income. So my husband has been able to take on more of the household responsibilities. Um, Moving yourself to a new country is probably not on the table for you right now, but I want you to know that before I moved to Portugal and in order to get more support, um, I had to be really creative in figuring out ways to get more support. But the reason why a lot of us struggle to utilize money for hiring help and making our lives easier is because, well, there's a lot of reasons. Maybe you grew up poor like I did and money was always scarce, so you're really scared to spend it. Maybe you have student loan debt like I did in the tens of thousands, and you're prioritizing that because you're taught that debt is bad and that having it is indicative of being a failure because you couldn't pay for your house in cash or pay for your car in cash like a lot of us were taught. I'm not a fan of Dave Ramsey. I was taught that I should do what he does, and I was made to feel very bad for having debt. And actually one of my biggest regrets is how much I prioritized paying off my student loans over getting myself the help that I needed. When I was drowning as a mom of two little kids, I literally had a two-year-old, a newborn, and I was caregiving daily for my brother who has, who has a very serious autoimmune disease and autism. And I remember I started making money um, from some YouTube videos I was creating for a client. And it was very, you know, not a lot of money. It was like $75 a video. I was like making $150 a month. And I remember talking with my husband and I said, I really want to hire a housekeeper to come. I'll spend the entire 150 hiring this housekeeper. I would love them to come in and scrub both of our bathrooms top to bottom, deep clean our kitchen, you know, and vacuum all of our carpets. I'm, I was um, pregnant in the third trimester with our second child. I was caregiving for my brother and I had my almost two-year-old. And we talked about it and talked about it. And in the, in the end, we decided, and I say we on purpose, it was both of us. You know what? We really should put that $150 towards student loans. Are you kidding me? When I look back, I'm so frustrated. But that was the framework that I was working with mentally. I believed, and my husband did too, that student loans, that debt of any kind was evil and wrong. And we needed to get rid of it because it meant that we were behind in life. And so I look back and I literally want to weep because I spent my weekends just cleaning. And so did my husband. We spent our weekends cleaning. We were so exhausted. And instead of enjoying my son before I brought in a second child, I honestly barely remember that time when he was between one and two. I was working part-time. I was making these videos. 
And I just think if I had just let myself hire a housekeeper, who by the way, I already knew of someone I trusted, she lived close by, like it was in the bag, and I didn't do it. And if I had hired her, I would have had my weekends back to take a nap, to be present with my son. Because get, don't get me wrong, we still went to the playgrounds and we went you know, to coffee after church and whatever, but I was so exhausted that I don't really remember that time. And it breaks my heart because I look back on videos of him like stringing together his first few sentences and I do not remember them. And it makes me really, really sad. And I really think that we forget that in this pursuit of paying off our debt or saving our money for a rainy day, we forget that there is a true cost to neglecting our well-being. There is a true cost to not investing in our well-being. And I'm still grieving that time. I'm still grieving the fact that I didn't realize that my time was valuable, that that time with my son at that age that only comes once is valuable and I'll never get it back. But guess what? The bathroom will always be dirty. The student loans will get paid off eventually. And I have a job and I always find a job, even though I've lost jobs, I always find a new one and I always find a way to figure it out. But I will never have that time back with my son when he was one year old and walking for the first time and discovering the world through that gorgeous little boy eyes. Like, it's really, really frustrating to me that I didn't have anyone around me to tell me that student loans are important, Mia, paying off debt's important, but like make sure it's never at the expense of your well-being. So don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that you should just ignore financial responsibility and that you shouldn't pay off your debt. What I am saying though is, are you, prioritizing these things at the expense of your well-being. Because what is the point of being so ill that you can't even enjoy your debt-free life? Like I remember when my husband and I paid off our debt, I was like in the pit of depression, completely burned out, and I wasn't all that excited. I had completely sacrificed my health in order to pay off this debt. And I wish I took that little bit of money I was earning from making videos and put it toward giving myself the gift of time and energy back instead of hurting my body exacerbating my chronic pain, giving myself flare-ups by cleaning the bathroom. So, um, and if anyone's listening to this, like, well, why didn't your husband clean the whole house himself? Because he was working overtime and I was staying at home. And that was the division of labor that we both agreed on at that time. And he still split the chores with me then. So I just want to point that out. But I really want to challenge you to take another look at your mindset around money. Are you sacrificing your well-being? Is there a way that you could find even a little bit of money per month to get just a little bit of help in your life? And I want you to visualize and imagine what that money could do for you in terms of help and how that help could give you back time and energy. What would you do with that time and energy? Would you take a nap on the weekend to feel a little bit more refreshed? Would you be a little bit more present with your kid at the playground because you're not exhausted all the time and numbing out on your phone because you just can barely keep your eyes open? Would you start exercising more on the weekend because you finally have energy to do so? And how could that give back even more ripples of energy and positivity into your life? Truly imagine what even a little bit of money invested in support could bring back to you. So many of us just think about, oh, the money leaving our account, the cost, but we forget that there is a cost to neglecting our well-being. And there is a cost to, you know, putting it all on ourselves all the time. And so think of money as a tool and that using it as a tool to support yourself is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And this whole like debt is evil philosophy, it's not serving or supporting you. And the last thing I want to say on this money piece is that when I was paying off my student loan debt and I was prioritizing that financially, I was paying double the minimum. So yes, I was aggressively tackling my student loans, but I could have easily paid the minimum, not accrued additional interest from miss, you know, penalty payments, I mean. Um, but I chose to double my minimum payment amount. I wanted to be super aggressive in paying that off. Um, and it's so funny how much that all or nothing mentality, which I'm going to talk about in a second, 
affected me because I could have easily decided, okay, you know what? The next three years of motherhood are going to be challenging. I have a toddler. I'm going to have a second child. I'm caregiving for my brother. So I'm just going to decide that for the next three years, instead of doubling my min my student loan payments every month, I'm going to drop them down to the minimum, knowing full well that I will increase how much I pay down on my student loans after I get through this really challenging and demanding time of motherhood. Because I really want to enjoy it. Because while it is a challenge, those early years, at least to me, are really special and precious. And they require all of you um, in order to really um, to make it through in a way that doesn't cause you to lose yourself, okay? So I wish I had someone who didn't struggle with perfectionism because I was really deep in my struggle with perfectionism at the time to say, hey, just because you reduce your student loan payments for a few years doesn't mean you're gonna do that forever. You're only doing it so that you can free up a couple hundred bucks a month so that you can have a dedicated weekly nap time for yourself and support with the house cleaning. That would have helped me so much. I would have been like, oh my gosh, you're right. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. I don't have to completely stop paying my student loans. This doesn't mean that I'm going to be in debt forever. This just means that I'm supporting myself strategically for the next few years. What a smart, brave, and loving thing to do for myself. So I harped on that a lot because I think that's the biggest obstacle that we face when it comes to taking care of ourselves and getting support. And I really want to encourage you to think through all of your obstacles and mindset and your narratives around money and figure out and, and visualize what your life could be like if you prioritize using money as a tool. The next obstacle that I see a lot in, well, that used to be my biggest issue and turns out it's an issue of a lot of us, um, is the martyr mom mentality. It's this idea that a martyr mom is a better mom. The mom who puts herself last, the mom who never thinks of herself, the mom who never prioritizes herself is the better mom. I grew up with a mother like this and I definitely went head first into motherhood with this mentality to the point where I felt extremely guilty if I ever prioritized myself. And I know we hear a lot like, hey, on like on Instagram, it's, it's okay to prioritize yourself, moms. It makes you a better mom. But I genuinely want to break this down for you right now, okay? When you're exhausted, are you more patient with your kids than when you're rested? When you haven't had a break, are you emotionally available to your kids as when you do give yourself regular breaks? When you haven't had any time to work out or make yourself healthy meals that you enjoy eating, do you have capacity to deal with your kids' meltdowns the way that you do when you did get a chance to do your favorite workout of the day and take a shower and have your favorite lunch? Really be honest with yourself about what being the martyr mom has looked like, what putting yourself last has looked like? What has it done for your motherhood truly? What has it done? I find that when I evaluate the cost of this mentality and what it takes from me and my kids, it makes me see this mentality as a very unsafe and harmful and toxic thing that it is. Because I think that unless we see it that way, we end up falling for the deception of it. And what I mean by that is when we're so used to thinking of martyr mom as like, well, my mom was like that and so was her mom and her mom before her, we start to feel like nostalgia around this way of doing life. Like sometimes I slip into the martyr mom mentality when it's the holiday season because that's when I saw my mom do it the most. But when I look back, I remember hating the holidays because it meant that my mom was going to be more exhausted. She was going to be more upset. She was going to be more reactive, more easily triggered. So were both of my parents. And it's because they were putting themselves last in the name of love. And in fact, all that did was make them a lot less loving. So I really think that society pressures us as moms to be martyrs. And I think that the most important thing that you can do is to recognize that being a martyr mom does not make you a better mom and that being last does not make you more loving. And that in fact, the more you prioritize yourself and love yourself and take care of yourself, the better mom you become. You actually can't mom when you're running around, cleaning all the time, cooking all the time, carrying the mental load alone, handling everything on your own. Like to me, 
Domestic labor is part of motherhood, but it is not motherhood in its essence. Motherhood to me is being emotionally available to your children in a way that only a mother can. And the moment I do too much of the domestic labor or I'm working too much and I lose that ability to be emotionally available, to me, that feels like I'm not able to be the mom that I want to be. And everyone gets to decide the kind of mom they want to be. You know, I do work a lot and I see that as a big part of being a mother because I am providing for my children and that is hugely valuable and important. But I will never work so much that I cannot be emotionally available for my kids. And whenever I feel that crop up because I do have, you know, chronic nightmares, PTSD, depression, so it's a sensitive thing for me. Um, I always try to make sure I balance it out by taking a break, taking a sick day from work, just doing whatever I can to make sure that I am not being a martyr because nobody benefits when I do that. The next obstacle that's getting in the way is probably perfectionism. I just touched on this a minute ago, but truly, I can't tell you how many times myself and my clients fall into this trap of thinking, well, Mia, you know what? It will be nice when I can afford a housekeeper and a child care and when I can afford a robot vacuum, and when I can afford to eat out once a week and you know order those lovely home chef pre-made meals, um, but I just can't do that right now. So I'm just gonna have to keep thugging it out and surviving. And I know exactly that mentality because I'm a recovering perfectionist and I can smell perfectionism from 10 miles away. And it, to that response, I always say, don't devalue how much a small change and a small amount of support can create a beautiful ripple effect in your life. You can start small. Why do we think that when the word support comes in, that it means that we need to be like the top 10% wealthiest in America and we need to be able to hire every form of help and we need to be able to outsource and delegate every single task we don't wanna do. That's not realistic for a vast majority of people. Instead of thinking I can't hire any help and I can't get any support until I can afford all the support and all the things, I want you to think, what do I actually have available to me right now financially? And what is the even the smallest amount of support that I can bring into my life in order to make my life a little bit easier, in order to feel a little bit more supported? I want you to intentionally start small. And, you know, this can look like, you know, for me, one of the things that I did, and I know I told the story of a client who also started running the dishwasher more often and, and um, used her robot vacuum. It's funny because I did a similar thing when I was going through my healing journey. And that was allowing myself to run the dishwasher more often and allowing myself to get a robot vacuum. I couldn't afford a weekly housekeeper. I couldn't even afford a monthly housekeeper at the time. But you know what? Getting that robot vacuum meant that I was able to actually start to take baths and I would take 45 minute baths and I would watch like a funny show and I'd have my Epsom salts with magnesium and my lavender oil and it was such a soothing and relaxing time that was just for me and enabled me to have more emotional bandwidth at the start of every new day for my kids. And all of that was given to me because of a robot vacuum that I bought. So I really want you to start small and to not allow perfectionism to steal support from you because really that's what that is. It's perfectionism, it's that all or nothing mentality saying, unless you can hire all of the help you need, then you have to wait 10 more years until your finances are perfect. Another thing I wanna point out with that is when you avoid doing this mental work of allowing help into your life, then when you do eventually have the resources in a few years or more, you're still gonna struggle with hiring the help because you've conditioned your brain and you've told your brain so many times that help is inaccessible, support is impossible, it's out of reach, that even when you have the money to do so, you're always gonna find another reason why you can't spend that money on help. So you have to practice this in the smallest ways, in the most doable ways. It is super important. Um, the last obstacle I wanted to touch on is the fact that we live in a hyper-independent society. This is a really important thing that we need to recognize. We need to recognize that we live in a bootstrap mentality, do it yourself, figure it out, I don't care about you, society. 
Western culture is all about this, okay? And it's all fine and dandy when you are, you know, you don't have kids, maybe you're in your 20s, you're building your career, you can figure it out. But like I said earlier, motherhood is inherently reliant on support. That's why people raise their children in villages. That's why people had that support around them. It was normal to have villages. It was normal for people to take time out of their day to support you, to show up for you. And now people aren't doing that as much because our, not because people are bad people, but because we're required to be at work all the live long day and because our economy demands it of us and our bosses demand it of us. I remember when I was working in an office uh, four months after I gave birth and became a mom for the first time, I had been at work for nine hours and I was like, I really need to go home. My boobs were engorged. I had so much breast milk in my body. Yes, I had my pump with me, but at that point I had pumped like four times at the office and I really wanted to go home and breastfeed my baby and my babysitter needed to leave. And I was like, I need to go home for the day. And it was past 6 p.m. And they were like, well, we have a client presentation that's due tomorrow. So everyone else is staying late. You should too. No one else on my team had a child. I was the only one on my team who had a child. And I said, you know, I'm happy to help out with the presentation slides um, later on tonight, but I need to go home and breastfeed my baby and I can get back online at 8 p.m. when he goes down for his first sleep session of the night. They're like, you can't take your laptop home. You need to work on this in office just like everybody else. Why do you think you should get special treatment? And so I just want to, I gave, I'm just sharing that story, first of all, because I know I'm not alone in experiencing these really negative, toxic work environments that don't accommodate parents. Um, but to just kind of talk about the fact that on top of workplaces that don't care about parents, we have really expensive childcare in the U.S., we have very inaccessible paid leave. And I know people are like, you're from California. They have some of the best paid leave laws. Yes, I used to work in paid leave in terms of like advocating for better policies. And so I know the law pretty well. You only get 60% of your income covered when you take paid leave. And I don't know about you, but most Californians are living paycheck to paycheck. Nobody can afford to live on 60% of their income. At least I knew I couldn't. So my husband was back to work two weeks after I gave birth. And so I found myself totally alone at home, changing an infant's diaper 12 times a day, trying to feed myself, trying to stay hydrated, trying to breastfeed, trying to shower myself. It was really, really, really hard. And the reason why I bring all of this up is because I think sometimes we tend to think and gaslight ourselves like we're just not trying hard enough and that's why we're struggling. Oh, I'm drowning because I need to like manage my time better. Maybe I need a better planner. Maybe I need to wake up earlier. Maybe I need to try harder. And I'm just like, girlfriend, look around you. We live in a society that says, do it yourself. Figure it out. I'm not going to accommodate you. And they make us feel bad for asking for accommodations. When I became a mom, even though I was a stellar employee and performer before I gave birth, all of a sudden I'm asking for accommodation for the first time and I'm being seen at as a slacker, seen as someone who doesn't care about the company. Like the tables turned so quickly when I became a mom at my job. And I don't say all of this to make you feel depressed because I, I mean, I know it's depressing, but the reason why I say all of this is because once I finally became aware of all of this, I stopped blaming myself for not quote unquote trying hard enough. I realized no one can try or hack their way through this. These are societal and systemic issues that are designed to make women have to stay home, which is what I ended up doing. I ended up leaving my career and taking a break and becoming a stay-at-home mom because I was so unwelcome in the workplace. And and then that's a whole nother episode for another day, the fact that I had to realize that just because I wasn't bringing home a paycheck, I had immense value at a, as a stay-at-home mom. And if you're a stay-at-home mom, so do you. I ended up working more hours at home, but didn't value, but valued myself and my contribution way less, which is a whole nother episode for another day. But the reason why I'm saying this is because we are meant to raise kids in a village and our society is not set up to make that easy and to make that possible. So when you are feeling like this is really hard, like support, finding support is really hard, it's because it is. It's not a you problem. It's nothing you've done wrong. You're not broken. The, the system around you as a mother is failing you. It's failing you miserably. And when I 
was able to come into awareness of all of this, it facilitated a deep compassion for myself. Instead of shaming and blaming myself when I found myself burnt out yet again, exhausted yet again, snapping at my children yet again, instead of shaming and guilting and blaming myself, I actually was able to quickly see how I was being failed by the system around me and how I was being unsupported. And it helped me to say, Mia, it's understandable why you're struggling right now. You're literally trying to run this home, pay these bills, take care of these children all on your own. This is impossible. And this is not the way it was designed. This is not the way it was meant to be. We're going to have love and compassion for ourselves. And it's from that place that I was able to get curious and come up with solutions. Um, and so I know some people are like, oh, you know, personal responsibility. If you, if you, if you talk about all these systemic issues, you're, um, deflecting blame and responsibility and you're somehow just going to sit there and complain all day. But actually the opposite happened. When I thought that it was all my fault, I was paralyzed by shame and guilt. But when I realized that I was being failed by my country, um, and I was able to point to specific instances, like I tried to put my kids in childcare and I couldn't afford it. Um, I tried to take paid leave and have my husband take paid leave, but we couldn't afford to only have 60% of our salary. I tried to get accommodations from work and they refused, you know, realizing tangibly, okay, this is not something I've done. This is something being done to me. And people are like, oh, that's a victim mentality. If anything, it just helped me to have way more compassion for myself, to stop blaming myself, to get out of paralysis and to actually go, okay, this is a crappy situation. Now, what can I do with this? What can I do to fight this? What can I do to advocate for myself even harder? What are all the other ways I might be able to get support that I might have overlooked? And how can I stop wasting my energy trying to get support from people who are determined for me to be burnt out and unsupported. So we're gonna take a quick break and when we come back, I'm gonna share um, I'm gonna share some multiple budget options in terms of getting support. You know, if you have little to no budget, medium budget, high budget for getting support, I wanna give you some ideas to get your brainstorming session flowing, which is a sneak peek into what the this week's self-care practice of the week is gonna be. I'm gonna encourage you to do that and try to brainstorm some support with what you have. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and take a break and I will see you after that. Hey guys, this is another friendly reminder that my coaching and community program, The No Longer Last Journey, is reopening with special bonuses on Sunday, October 22nd. If you are confused because you listened to the last few episodes and I set a different date, it's because I had to take two weeks off in the middle of this series. But the new reopening date is Sunday, October 22nd. Today, I just wanna focus on sharing with you about the classes and the companion reflection guides that go with those classes. Because a lot of people don't realize that in addition to my monthly coaching call, I actually have 12 classes, one for every month of the year because this is a 12 month coaching program. And in these classes, I take you in a process of, you know, identifying your needs, identifying your obstacles, and then overcoming those one at a time, and then practicing self care one at a time. And in this process, I take a trauma informed lens. And I really want to unpack this because I think that the word trauma or the phrase trauma informed is being used a lot now. And I think there's some misunderstanding. So when I say trauma informed, I do not mean that I heal your trauma. I am not an EMDR therapist, a trauma therapist. That is not the goal of my trauma informed classes or my trauma informed self care coaching approach. What I mean by trauma informed is I encourage you to look deeper in all of my classes. So in addition to giving you hacks and tips and advice for how you can practice self-care and set boundaries and change your mindset around certain things, I ask you questions and give you examples of how trauma, anything distressing, whether you label it traumatic or not, from your past or your present could be making it hard for you to practice self-care. So a lot of times my clients don't even realize that what they've gone through might be traumatic or might be distressing or that it might be impacting them today, even though it happened to them 20 years ago. So a great example of this is a client that I had who um, really struggled to take a shower on a regular basis. And she felt a lot of guilt and shame around this. She's like, I'm a grown woman and I still don't take a shower every day. I find it really hard and really anxiety inducing. First of all, I, I get you because I have those days as well. And secondly, what I thought was so powerful 
was we spent a whole month just on this, just on hygiene. And I asked questions and gave examples that helped her realize that when she was a kid, she was always rushed in the shower. She was told that she couldn't take up too much time, couldn't take up too much water, and that she needed to hurry up. So even though that was years ago, And she's in her own house now and she's a grown woman. She still struggles with that feeling, this feeling that she needs to hurry up. She's not allowed to take her time, even if she's really exhausted and wants to take a slow shower. And so once she uncovered that and labeled that as traumatic or distressing, she realized that she doesn't want to approach her showers like that anymore. And I asked her to reflect on what her new narrative was going to be. What's an affirmation that you're going to repeat to yourself every time you feel this resistance to taking a shower? How can you respond to this, like, you know, that nudge that you feel in your stomach or your chest, that anxiety that says, oh, this was a trauma point for us. We don't want to do this. We don't want to take this shower. It reminds us that we need to hurry up. It reminds us that we're a waste of space. And she came back with the most beautiful affirmation, which was, I am an adult now and I make the rules. I am an adult now and I make the rules. And I was like so blown away by that. And that's what I mean by trauma-informed self-care coaching. I am not going to sit down and show you how to time block your calendar. I am not going to tell you you need to wake up earlier. I am not going to tell you that you just need to be more efficient. I really think that for those of us who have been abused, for those of us who struggle with perfectionism, all of these types of hacks it can end up leaning in the direction of making this all on us without recognizing that a lot of us are struggling because of crap that happened to us or is happening to us. And so I give examples of ways that something traumatic could be bothering you still. And I give you questions and prompts in every class and every reflection guide to help you figure out, okay, what has happened or is happening that I need to become aware of and uproot. And actually a lot of my clients never went to therapy before they started working with me. And in the process of working with me and going through all of these journaling prompts and classes, they realized, you know what? I actually did go through a significant amount of trauma in my childhood and I'm gonna start seeing a trauma therapist. And some of my clients started trauma therapy with therapists for the very first time in their lives, taking their healing journey to the next level. So I am not a therapist. I am not going to heal your trauma. I do not claim to. I want to be very clear that my classes are designed to help you become aware if you have any of that trauma so that you can decide for yourself what the next step of your healing journey is, what additional support you can bring into your life. Because unfortunately, a lot of us don't even realize that we went through trauma or name that what we went through was traumatic because a lot of us were raised with the idea that the only people who can say that they've been traumatized are people who've been through something really, really, really severe and significant. So that's what I wanted to let you know about today in terms of the classes. I'm super proud of all the classes that I've created. I spent over a year producing these classes um, and you can take a look at them at my website, miahemstad.com forward slash no longer last which I always link in the show notes for you so that you can take a look at all the different classes and what each of them does for you. So that's all I have for you today. Don't forget to be on my email list so that you're aware of when the program reopens, what the special bonuses are, and get that discount code, um, which is gonna come to you next week, Sunday on October 22nd. All right, let's get back to the show. All righty, so brainstorming is my favorite. I love a good brainstorm session, especially when you challenge yourself to not fall into restrictive thinking of, well, I can't afford that. Well, that's not possible for me right now. Well, I want a housekeeper, but I don't even know who I would hire or who I could trust. I want you to approach brainstorming as if it's a wish list. Be a kid again and just let yourself dream of all the things that you could possibly want. So in this next part, of the podcast episode today. I want to give you some ideas to just help you get started because this week's self-care practice is you brainstorming ways that you can bring in support depending on your budget. So some low budget support ideas that honestly are overlooked way too often. The first one is getting pre-made meals from Costco or Trader Joe's, Sprouts, whatever grocery store you have near you. Grocery stores are getting better and better about making pre-made meals that are pretty healthy. 
Not all takeout slash pre-made meals are unhealthy. If you just look and give yourself the chance to break out of your typical thinking of, if I want a healthy meal, I have to make it from scratch, get out of that mindset and go look at the pre-made meal section. You're gonna be able to save yourself an hour or even two hours by just getting that pre-made meal, get twice as much and eat and cook three dinners worth and so that you don't have to have three nights worth of dishes. It's amazing. When I gave myself permission to not make everything from scratch, and again, I had this all or nothing mentality that if I went to pre-made meals, my family would never eat a meal from scratch. That can't be further from the truth. Maybe you can make a meal from scratch one to two times a week and the rest of the time you commit to pre-made meals. It just costs a little bit more than making it from scratch and it saves you a ton of time and energy. Another tip is find a church run support group for childcare. Um, I was able to, and I say this with sensitivity because I went to one church group where they were extremely judgmental and I immediately ran out of there. Um, but I found another group that wasn't pushing me to go to their church service, but they started a mom's group that was, it was super well organized and they had amazing professional childcare. And that was my very first time I was able to drop my son off for one and a half hours every week. And I had a uh, potluck brunch with other moms and I was able to just focus on my newborn and breastfeed her and there was usually some form of like a speaker or some sort of entertainment and I remember just being so grateful I was going through postpartum depression and anxiety at this time I was really struggling with my mental health and this once a week support group um this mom's group where I was able to have a reason to leave my house and a reason to get dressed it really helped me. It was like a light that I had in my life once a week. And I think that if you can just take a look in your community and see if there's any um, church run support groups with good childcare, I recommend looking into that. And it doesn't need to be church run. The reason why I say church run is just because they usually, um, they're a lot more affordable. So um, just take a look at that and see what you can find. Yeah, it might not be the same as hiring a sitter who comes to your house for four hours a day or four hours a week. You know, like I said, this once a week support group or mom group was only, you know, one to two hours. It was very, very brief, but it was still something. And again, we need to stop belittling um, the support that we can afford to bring in. Even if it's the smallest amount, instead of feeling ashamed about that, I want you to be proud of yourself that you even had the guts to get yourself support, that you cared enough about yourself to get yourself support, even if it was small. I think the shame factor, and I wish I could afford as much as Becky over there, it, we need to let that go because it's seriously not serving you and it's not letting you, um, it's not let, allowing you to enjoy motherhood and enjoy this very temporary time that I know can feel like forever, but it is a temporary time that we have with our kids. So definitely look into whatever form of childcare you can get. Um, another thing I suggest if you have a low budget is deciding on a nap schedule. So maybe you can't even do a church run support group or something, but you can decide with a really concrete conversation with your partner. Look, I'm sleep deprived. I need more naps. You need more naps. Let's trade off. You get Saturday morning, I get Sunday morning or vice versa, where one parent has to get up with the kids on the weekend, um, on one of the weekend days and you alternate. This is huge. And I wish my husband and I did it sooner. We kind of did that whole, oh, um, who's getting up with the kids? You get up. No, you get up. I'm tired. No, I'm tired. And neither of us saw any hope because we both were not, um, we weren't delegating and we weren't, um, committing. Um, if you are a single parent, is there a friend or a family member that you can, just be vulnerable and say, I am looking for someone I trust to childcare swap with me. I think we need to be honest more about our need for help. And listen, I know how vulnerable this can be because sometimes people say, no thanks. Sometimes your friends have more resources than you and they don't need your help. I have had this happen to me before. I was really really sad about it. I remember reaching out to someone I trusted and I said, hey, would you be interested in a child care swap? And she was like, no. And I was really exhausted and I was really broke and I didn't have the money for any child care. Um, and I had moved to a different city and there were no more um, church run support groups. So I want to say that I understand that vulnerability and that risk, but I think that your health and well-being are worth the risk. And if you need that help and support, definitely reach out and ask. I ended up um, reaching out to an aunt of mine who lived two hours away and I said, I really need your help. Can you please 
come over and she was only able to come over once a month because she lived two hours away but she would come over and she would be there for like four to six hours sometimes and that made all the difference in the world i would look forward to that one day a month that she would come and take care of my kids and i would take a long shower walk to the library enjoy the sun enjoy the peace and quiet and then walk back home like i said i had no money at this time no disposable income so i wasn't taking myself out to coffee or lunch or anything I was just enjoying the peace and quiet and enjoying not having to have my brain split between so many different people and so many different needs. So I just want to give you all those examples because I think so many of us are like, well, I don't have any friends that are willing to do that. And it's like, well, my family lives too far away. It's like I have my aunt lives very far away and I still had to, you know, humble myself and get vulnerable and ask her for help. So don't give up on that. Make sure you really evaluate and exhaust all of your options. Um, another idea I wanted to give you is, um, like I said before, run that dishwasher, put the dang hand wash in there. I don't care if you have to run the dishwasher two times a day, you are worth the money of the little bit of electricity and the water that you're going to use to run that dishwasher twice. And remember, if you're eco-conscious like me, this can be a temporary thing. If you're like, oh, I really should be not doing this. It's like, just do it for now. Just know that it's not forever. And you know what? Also... Those of us who are super environmentally conscious need to remember that we're not the ones who cause all of this climate change. And this is about fossil fuels. And this is about, you know, honestly, the legislators that allow corporations to, to put all of our food in plastic and all of those things. So do not feel bad about saving yourself an hour every evening by loading up the pots and pans after dinner into that dishwasher. That's what I've been doing. Yes, sometimes I cringe because I was taught that you do not put pots and pans in the dishwasher because it takes up too much room and you should wait until breakfast and put the breakfast dishes in there, blah, 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 blah. No, I want you to run the dishwasher twice a day, give yourself an extra hour back in your life. You do not deserve to be spending your free time, your little bit of precious free time standing at that sink, scrubbing crap out of the frying pan, okay? No more, we cannot do that anymore, okay? Here are some medium budget support ideas. Number one, robot vacuum. Mine cost $400, best $400 I spent in my life. I got that much later on in my journey of my financial journey, but it was worth it. Um, Saved me about 45 minutes an evening um, and I was able to take nice long showers. It was great. Um, A bi-monthly housekeeper. Like I said, you'd be surprised when you look up how much housekeepers actually cost. They're not that expensive and they're professionals. They know that they can get into your house and clean it quickly. So they're not going to charge you an arm and a leg if you find a good one. Um, So they can come every other week and deep clean your kitchen, your bathrooms. They can mop your floors. They can vacuum. And all you got to do is just do the maintenance tasks like getting your dishwasher and running every night and uh, wiping your table and counters. Okay, get that help. It's going to just free up so much time and energy for you. Um, weekly takeout order in every Friday so that you know that on Fridays you get to watch a movie and put your feet up because you're not cooking at all Um, a staycation go for one to two days by yourself with a friend with your partner go for one to two days every six months I'm literally talking only twice a year you go and you make sure you get a hotel you don't need to get a flight you don't need to get transportation. You just drive to a hotel, a four-star or three-star hotel. I did this one time and it was amazing to just wake up in a bed without having a kid's foot in my face, without having been woken up eight times at night. Give yourself that gift, okay? And some high budget support ideas, weekly housekeeper, daily childcare, pre-made meals multiple times a week, ordering healthy takeout multiple times a week, staycation every six weeks. And I know some of you are like, yeah, obviously, if you have a lot of money, you would do all that. But you'd be surprised if you do not condition your mind to valuing help and believing you are worthy and deserving of that help. You're going to start to earn more money as you get older or further along in your career and you're still not going to give yourself that help and you're going to wake up in your 40s and 50s and realize that you have been exhausting yourself and living a life of stress and you didn't need to. And I would hate for you to wake up and realize that you could have had so much more ease and been so much more present and so much more emotionally available and enjoyed your youth so much more if you had just let yourself have more ease in your life. So use these ideas as a springboard to brainstorm what you're going to do this week. And that is your uh, self-care practice of this week. I want you to brainstorm all the different needs that you have and the potential solutions for each need. 
Do not limit yourself. This gets to start as a wish list. Then I want you to have a distraction-free financial meeting with yourself or with your partner if that applies to you. And I want you to identify how much money you can free up in your budget to get more support in order to prioritize your health and well-being. Your future self is definitely going to thank you for this. So the distraction-free financial meeting piece is really important. Do not just write down all of your needs and all the things you wish you had and all the support you wish you had without following it up with an actual financial planning meeting. That is important. Put this work into motion. Bring in support into your life, even in the smallest way. And if the idea of hiring any form of support right now feels so scary, I truly want you to start small and remember that you can always build on it over time. I think sometimes, especially for those of us who have money trauma and who grew up poor, we got to really ease into this. We cannot go head first because it gets scary and then we recoil. And I don't know who can re relate to this. Let me know if you can, but I tend to... Uh, go head first and then snap back super far like a rubber band. Like, oh my gosh, I spent too much money on this or that. And then all of a sudden I want to be frugal for the next like eight weeks. Okay, that's not good either. You want to practice kind of finding that happy medium and um, going one step at a time and allowing your brain to adjust. Basically going, okay, I hired support. I delegated this thing. I allowed myself to have it the easy way because frugality is honestly very very hard i'm allowing ease into my life and i didn't die and i didn't become unhoused and i didn't lose my ability to pay my rent or to pay my bills or to pay for my childcare. everyone survived when i got help and if anything maybe you're thriving a little bit maybe you're having a little bit more time for your hobbies or to watch tv in the evening or to take a longer shower you know Allow yourself to take those small steps and to realize that everyone and everything improved because of it. And so, yeah, that's what I want to pass on to you as we close out this series. I really hope that you found this helpful, this episode and the series. I'm so excited to welcome all of you who are interested in joining the No Longer Last Journey. I... Uh, Hopefully we'll answer all of the questions you have via emails, but if you need to chat with me, you can email me and I can set up a time for us to chat for free. Um, but before we close out, I wanna give you your affirmation of the week. And that is, you do not have to be last to be loving. I want us all to remember how much the martyr mom mentality just is so pervasive and it's so oppressive and it's constantly taught to us and told to us and modeled to us and I want you to remember that being a martyr actually takes you away from being a mom it doesn't make you a better mom putting yourself last doesn't benefit anyone it's actually very harmful and very toxic and sometimes when I really am struggling to prioritize myself I remember that I have a daughter and I do not want her to see me modeling that behavior. So an affirmation that I've been leaning on for years and that I wanted to share with you today as we close out this series is you do not have to be last to be loving. And as always, I share the affirmations in my weekly email. Um, this email is going to be going out along with this podcast episode. So make sure you download that and save it as your cell phone background. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. I am so grateful for you. And I hope that even if you are not able to join the No Longer Last journey this time around, that I will work with you eventually in some capacity. Um, and that these episodes can serve to be a support and guide to you along the way in your own healing journey. All right. Love y'all. And I will talk to you next time. Bye. Mm -hmm.